Okay, gonna give everybody a second to come on in to the webinar. Okay, everybody. So hello, we are here with Jane Road with JSR Associates. Um, JSR Associates represents healthcare and senior living design consultants who believe people are at the center of all they do. And she's gonna be presenting on the design of residential assisted living and creating successful community tonight. So now that I've given her a nice little introduction, I'm gonna let you have the floor, Jane. So take it away with your beautiful presentation. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. And welcome from everyone on the West Coast too, because you guys have a little earlier time frame than we do. So it's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to sharing some different information with you. I thought I would give you a little bit of background. Um, we've been in senior living consulting for the last 30 years. Uh, it really is about the, the heart part of what we do in terms of the people we care for and the staff that we work with. Um, my background is architecture and design. Uh, I've worked for some of the larger CCRC developer uh, for about eight years for Erickson Retirement Communities before I started my practice. So I've been in practice for a little over 25 years. And so I thought what I would do is kind of talk a little bit, I mean, you guys know residential assisted living pretty well. So I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but also want to talk a little bit about the intersection of where we've come in from residential side into the what we call the household small house side. And some of this will be new for some of you and some of it probably won't be, but I thought it would be a good place to start for conversation and then go into the community and then talk about some of the actual really specific, and this is my nitty gritty world, of what we do in terms of design that helps support uh, the intention of person-centered care, but it also supports the outcomes of both our staff and our residents. So I thought we would look at the residential assisted living, the household small house, and then this community-based service piece. I always find that when operators see the two ladies chatting with the big knife in her hand, that they kind of get very nervous. Um, I like to think of that as she's chopped vegetables for her entire life, and that if she can have a cup of coffee and a chat and still ch chop them up, then that should be okay. I know things have to have a certain amount of balance between liability and living. Uh, we kind of err to the side of risk uh, to a certain degree. So it's always balancing that comfort and risk and safety. So uh, we believe in both, uh, but we also like to find out what's what makes people tick and try to support that in the things that we design. So when we look at residential and the household small house model, we think of it as assisted living, it could be memory care, it could be for specialty populations. We've worked with vulnerable populations of different kinds, uh, ranging from autism to uh, different kinds of disabilities and an adult daycare kind of setting. And so one of the reasons when we look at residential, which is where I think the world should be, is that I came out of the other side. So I came out of what I would call the facility side and the facility side coming into trying to deinstitutionalize back into a home, whereas the residential assisted living movement and, and direction it's going, it comes out of homes and bringing service to homes. So I think there's things we can learn from both sides and a lot of it looks the same, but it's operated quite a bit differently. So when we think about the residential model, you're really a single family home character. I mean, it really is a single family home. And you have that great room in the residential kitchen and the dining living spaces and a variety of different shared and private bedrooms and bathrooms, considering how if it came from more of a renovation project or an existing home or it's being built more purpose built. And then this idea of having outdoor space, we have a lot of research and evidence-based design is something that we base most of our decisions on. And that access to nature has a huge input in terms of the quality of health of both the residents themselves as well as the staff. And then looking at the care levels, and the care levels can range everywhere from unlicensed, which we've been working on a community in Indiana that's unlicensed, all the way up to being fully licensed through the health department or kind of a middle of the road license that might come through the Department of Social Services. So it really depends state by state, license types dependent, and it's about your care population and who you wanna care for. Um, some of you may have seen this before. This is Dave Reese's house. He's a member of the organization. Um, we've loved working with Dave. This is his first home. And we had the, the privilege and pleasure of being able to work with him on, on designing this and working on the operations side uh, in terms of developing the Evermore Senior Living. And so it has that entrance area and you come in and it has the, the living space um, that is the shared living space, you know, the corridors going to either side. 
small things to look at are things, the details of what we know from senior living, uh, zero threshold transitions, looking and evaluating those, uh, where handrails go, um, what's the lighting level, how does the lighting level adjust, um, how do you make somebody feel as comfortable as possible and as home-like and as at home as possible. Um, having the, the larger open kitchen, which we see in, in most settings, um, and then the resident rooms. We worked very hard in this case to make sure that the uh, we have a radiant heat panel actually in this room that's over the window and that was more for the comfort of the residents so we know that there's always a little bit of conflict when the mechanical systems because the staff needed to be a little cooler generally speaking and the residents usually like to have it much warmer. We also know that when you do the through wall units there's noise, there's air airflow, things like that that can be irritating and, and not very good for quality of life and also for the acoustics issues and so having those longer windows and having a great view out um, has really proven uh, in the literature to demonstrate better outcomes, that when people have an actual view or they can access daylight, that they do much better in terms of, of how they're feeling and the satisfaction of what they have. When we look at household models, very similar. You've got kind of the same kind of idea. Some, however, are individual small homes, so there are houses in a community like a residential assisted living would be, but some are also connected to communities. So you may have a household or a small house that's actually adjacent to a larger assisted living or a larger independent living or part of a community in general. So sometimes it'll have a centralized kitchen and then you spread out from there and then you have the small residential kitchen that's part of the actual home. So it, it's similar in terms of that, but this was really a movement and the movement was access to be able to bring people out of institutional living. We should not be institutionalizing our elders and looking at what I call the 90-10 rule. 90% of that person has, has had a life, has things they like, has dislikes, has things that they want to participate in, things that they don't want to participate in, what time they get up in the morning, all those things that make up a person. And, and the 10% is really the, the ability that has created an opportunity that they need to have care services. And so I try to think of it as person first and who are they, what's their life, and then what is the care service that we need to help support them to maximize that as much as possible. And so that's kind of the, the goal with that. Very similar in terms of the outcomes in terms of the living space as well. So some of you may know this, um, I was had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Bill Thomas in the very early years when he was developing something called the Eden Alternative. And it was just simply an idea that institutionalized double-loaded corridors did not have to be the way that we provided care for our residents and that people weren't meant to live in that environment. It was really modeled after the acute care um, model in terms of a hospital. And so he started decentralizing it and creating these homes and he called it the Eden Alternative. And, and when it was first came out, it was really in the older settings. And then he realized that those institutional settings were part of the barrier and that was the development of the Greenhouse Project. And the very first ones were in Tupelo, this was in Tupelo, where it was a residential kitchen that was set up and, and residents could have at-will food, they had access to water, they had, could have a cup of coffee. It felt like a home. Uh, he had a, a name for the caregivers of Shabazim, basically a, a bit of a made up word in term. But the idea was that it was an elder care assistant and that it was a universal worker model. So we've seen universal workers, we've seen uh, homemakers slash personal care models work. We've seen all different kinds of combinations of staff to make this work in terms of a different way of living. Uh, he has another model that he has been working on, the most recent one, it's called Minka, and it's a house for regular people. And it talks about having multi-generations um, within one setting. Um, so this gives you kind of a little bit of a set of the background. Uh, we did the first Eden Alternative set of households, we did them as duplexes actually in Tennessee, in Pleasant Hill, Tennessee, in a little teeny town in the middle of, uh, the, middle of the state of Tennessee. This is Cottages at Hearthstone. This is a project that Pope Architects, one of my colleagues worked on, and it has the same sense of the home, a little bit bigger than you would see often in terms of that, but this is a household that's attached to additional uh, households. So basically there's a spline that runs behind it that connects households like these um, along a longer spline. This is their household. Um, they did post and pre-occupancy evaluation, so they actually knew what would work and what wouldn't work and have made some modifications to some of their plans uh, and their kitchen layouts. Uh, for example, closing up one end seemed to be a better idea in terms of allowing residents some access but not complete full access to the kitchen, particularly for those with memory care issues. 
uh, having access to the outside, looking at indirect lighting, uh, a lot of different uh, components of that in terms of the residential feel of what we've been trying to work toward and out of the institutional setting. Um, I particularly like this one that actually is the architect to the left that's sitting there that is having a conversation with the staff. Um, but this was one of their other solutions where the swinging doors was still allow people to be involved and participate in the kitchen life, but also allow them to be able to, to have that closed off to a certain degree for resident safety. Um, this is for memory care that was utilized with good daylight and access to daylight uh, in terms of the kitchen space. In the resident room, and I really like this picture predominantly because there is tons of daylight that floods the space, and I think that is really important. And again, they've looked at an alternative for the type of system that they use mechanically. Um, instead of using through walls, we've used everything from heat pumps to various types of vertical uh, units and VAV boxes and the like, uh, but really do not recommend the through wall units. So when we talk about community-based service, you might think, hmm, why, why would this be included in what we're talking about? Part of this for me is part of my passion of, of evaluating intergenerational living, but part of it is also the opportunity that community-based services can definitely assist with your residential assisted living when it's in a community and vice versa. And so I wanted to show you a few examples of, of where I think this is really important when you start looking at how community-based service works and then accumulates into the opportunities for residential assisted living to be part of that. So this is a project that we worked on a number of years ago and the, the client was one of those amazing people who just really wanted to bring her independent residents as much service as possible. So she had an assisted living program that was part of her building, but it wasn't a license for assisted living. And she was having trouble getting it to work. And so she thought, you know, she couldn't quite make the numbers work and the, the way the program was structured and how people had to enroll, it wasn't really working. So she took that gold space that had been for assisted living and she leased it out to a home health care agency. So in this case, right in her own building, she has a home health care agency, and then they added outpatient rehab, and that provided a continuum of care that isn't perfect, but it is for a moderate and lower income group of folks. It provided a continuum of care that kept them independent much longer. And when you think about length of time and length of stay, if you can keep somebody that can have more quality of life for six months, a year, two years, three years, that's a very long time as you get older. And so that, that's something that stuck with me, this idea of what happens if you add service. So the other thing she did is she partnered with the local senior center, which is something that a residential assisted living, if you had two or three homes, could also do. And that senior center was able to, uh, they didn't have food resource, they needed a kitchen. She had a full kitchen downstairs because she had to have that for the assisted living program. And so she agreed to allow them to cook all their meals there in exchange for a meal a day for every one of her residents. So there was a way to do that on a community-based platform and a, and a different approach to be able to provide service to a much more extended population. So when you think about this, I think that that has ramifications that we could look at that in, in different ways and add that in potentially. Uh, I have another colleague, she uh, has a senior center and it opened two weeks before COVID. So you can imagine, brand new building, it was in North Carolina, it opened up and she's ready to go and everything changed. So she goes, oh, the design of it would have been completely different if I had realized we were going to be, you know, all this virtual work was going to be happening and things like that. But what she didn't realize is that by doing the senior center uh, programming and starting to do these programs with uh, at home and on Zoom, she used Wake Forest for students to basically canvas her seniors and her elders to help them learn how to use the, the system. So she got the systems all set up in various folks' homes and so that they could do virtual. And then when they did do some back on live, they could come in live. But what she wasn't anticipating is that not only the local community was using it, but people from around the state were using it. So if we think about this from a virtual perspective and you're thinking about how do I introduce activities and how do I get more activities and how can I broaden that, you actually could broaden that by having um, a part-time activities director or a part-time activities person and have this supplemented by doing virtual programming that could be set up with your local senior center or your local university or your local community college. So again, it gave us another resource that I don't know that any of us would have completely 
realized. Um, she was also able to help other assisted living settings that were closed down during COVID that didn't have access to activities. So I, I think that there's something to be learned from those lessons and that we can um, maybe maximize some of that or even apply that to some of the residential assisted living work. The other thing that I found that I thought was very interesting, we did our post-occupancy evaluation in this building. We had provide, we had this wonderful little woman. She was in our one of our focus groups. We always do focus groups at the beginning of our programming. And we asked her, um, she said, what I would really like is to be able to personalize my space. And I said, well, well, well what do you mean? You know, what, what would that work with? And, and she goes, well, I would really like to pick a color and, and pick some of the finished colors of what could happen in my, in my own apartment so I could personalize that. So we gave them some different palettes to be able to do that and, and have some selection and some control over what they wanted. And I asked her, she was dressed in head to toe, she was dressed in lilac. And I said, so what would your color be? And she's like, oh, well, lilac, my dear, of course. So she was just darling and lovely. And come to find out that was one of the top two things that in the accessible bathrooms that we were able to provide in very small footprints, um, we were able to provide those two things, that those were the top two, even though all the community space had been renovated as well, that was really the top two things that the residents felt that they were cared about and, and really felt satisfied with that had happened. Uh, this is another project up in uh, Garden Spot Village, which is uh, up in New Holland, in Pennsylvania. Um, the colleague who works here, uh, he runs it, uh, in Steve Lindsay, he's been a good friend and colleague for many years. And uh, we work together on guidelines and other things as well. And so they have other alternatives. So they have things called Sycamore Springs. It's like their small cottage plan. So this would be your, your typical two bedroom home. Then they took the two bedroom home idea and started thinking about what would it look like if it was a cooperative home. So this is just, again, a bigger home, but instead of it being for assisted living, it's actually for unrelated independent living residents. So this gives a more affordable option for those who may want to live together in a more communal setting, but it also is on a sliding scale. So one of the residents, for example, she could have easily afforded to move into a larger continuing care retirement community side on the other side of the campus, and she could have moved in with that with a, with the a substantial down payment. But there was another woman who was going to lose her place in her apartment because it went up $100 a month, and that was outside of her budget and her means. So this gave people a chance to be able to live in, in a similar setting in both of those those women, in that, that case, they're both women, chose to want to live in the in the cooperative house. So you have chores and you have things you do like you would have kind of like having roommates and many people call it the golden girl model. Um, but what I really like about it is that I think sometimes we think about this as something that we would only do for assisted living, but I think you could also look at this as a viable option for doing it for independent living as well. And I think that there's, there's um, progress that you could make with that. So for example, if you had four homes or three homes and you had one independent home and two assisted living homes and maybe a fourth home for memory care, you provide a, a mini version of a continuum of care. And I think that that has, has possibility and potential as well as allowing people to age in place. People would prefer to stay where they are. We all know that. Um, and embedded in the neighborhood seems to be something that's much more preferable versus being in a, what would be viewed as a facility or a facility base. Um, this has five bedrooms in it, so it's five un unrelated adult residents, independent living that live here. Um, and so it's just a big home. So you come in, it has a shared kitchen in the dining living room, a uh, hallway that goes back, and the five bedrooms that wrap around. Uh, everyone does have access to a, a bathroom, a full bathroom in this case. So something else we've been working on is, as I started a nonprofit a couple of years ago, it finally got all put in place during COVID. And we basically started it on the idea that intergenerational living and person-centered care is, is gives us the best quality of, of environments for living. And, and we started calling it living instead of more like senior living, because in a sense, it's, it's intergenerational. We want it to be more like a multifamily that actually has accessible spaces, but it also has access to care and community and amenities. And it also has access to higher levels of care in different ways. And so I thought this would be an interesting thing to show you because I think it has some relevancy in terms of how do we define residential assisted living. So I kind of tried to push the, the definition a little bit with the licensed folks. 
So what we look at here is having a triad of nursing, social work, and OTPT as part of the staffing model. And what we found is that that gives us very good coverage and a very interdisciplinary team. And it also provides a, an opportunity for all three of those disciplines to work together. And we think that we get better outcomes when that's the case. And then that also allows us to cross train. So one of the other things we think is an issue, and we all have this, I think, on our minds, is the idea of how we're gonna staff because we don't have enough folks um, coming in and we haven't um, been able to do good retention and what does all that look like? So we started thinking about that from a training perspective, looking at housing, uh, that's more affordable for the actual staff to live in um, or that's adjacent or that's nearby. We've also been looking at childcare because one of the providers that we work with out of Michigan said that's my biggest problem is that they don't have childcare that's accessible in, in nearby. So we've been talking about what are some of these other community partnerships that help us support our industry so that they support our homes and our residents and in sequence. And so we've looked at intergenerational living and it could be elders, families, students, youth. Um, and I've worked a lot with the vulnerable population of underserved youth. And I think we're missing an opportunity with our youth because I think similar to elders and facilities, we've had a tendency of, of almost incarcerating youth in terms of how we've institutionalized them. So trying to evaluate and maximize that because I think we're losing a generation of, of kids that could really actually be quite successful in the aging and healthcare fields. So looking at maximizing services and economics, local needs, reimbursements, community issues, all of that, and looking at a, continu a continuum of healthy lives for all ages uh, has been part of our, our mission with this. So we look at things, we're kind of the anti-developer in, in a sense, because we look at things from a grassroots base. And so we've been looking in Cumberland, Maryland, we've been working on a project in Detroit, Michigan. We've been working on some things in Meridian, Mississippi. All three have completely different needs are they related? Yeah, absolutely related to some of the same things we see. Transportation, um, access to service, where's my extended care coming from, not being institutionalized, being more person-centered. So what we figured out there was definitely a handful of components, but every community didn't necessarily need the same components. So they may need more affordable housing or student housing to supplement their staff. Um, in another case, they may um, need some access to more amenities because they already have a lot of senior living in terms of apartment housing, but they don't have any activity spaces and, and anything that's coordinated in terms of access to care and services and amenities. So it's been a very interesting journey um, in terms of looking at this. We figured out a lot of, that won't work, but we've also figured out quite a bit that can work. And so some of those are things like a virtual village, which is the Village to Village Network. Um, that's where they, um, I think the Beacon Hill Village was the first one out of Boston, and they created an opportunity that you, if you pay in as a membership fee, it's a very small fee, but then you pay for the service, but you have somebody who coordinates anything from transportation to getting an expertise that you need in terms of a, a health issue. Um, it could be um, needing care for temporary for a small period of time because you've had a knee replacement. It could be almost anything. And so and depending on how the, the Village to Village Network is set up. Some people also do it on a CHIT system where I, I provide transportation for you today and hopefully you'll provide transportation for someone else down the road. So there's different ways of looking at it. We also figured out that we did a small research study with actually some STEM uh, students um, out of a high school. And we asked them, what are the things that would bring residents and older people and youth and potentially at-risk youth or underserved youth, what would bring them together? And there weren't any real big surprises, but it did confirm a lot. And we had two groups do it, and the two groups came up back with the same suggestions that cafe or some type of dining, it's food, it's about food, bringing food to the you know, to the neighborhood, to the community. And so we found that in many cases, in terms of revitalization in different projects, that uh, food is the source. Uh, so it could be a local cafe or similar to the Mathers cafes that they have in Chicago, um, having that opportunity to have a cafe, but it doesn't have the stigma of oh, old people use this. So it was built for the community. And so when we look at it from a community-based perspective, I think this could be applicable also to a group of homes. Uh, physical activity was the other piece in terms of having some type of recreation that you did that was somewhat coordinated, but also it could have some natural spontaneity to it in terms of neighboring and learning and, and understanding both older, older needs and younger people's needs. And then technology was the third, which was no surprise there. But this opportunity to have access, internet, reverse mentoring opportunities, I can think of a whole host of folks, including myself, that would really benefit from a 12-year-old's you know, expertise in technology. 
So training, engagement, and activity, so both virtual, in-person, and scheduled, and then supporting that activity. So some of it has space requirements that go along with that, but then a lot of times there may be other spaces that are already can be shared through the community that are there um, and can be reactivated or additionally activated. Um, Leland Kaiser was one of my, he's a futurist, he's passed now, but he was one of my very early mentors in terms of just finding him to be amazing. And he would say, any church that's only used on Sundays is an underutilized asset. So I always remembered that because of how he approached things in terms of maximizing the use of what you could use in the community. So outdoor access, like dedicated space, uh, community at large, we do know that people do a lot better when they have access to the outdoors. Other things that we thought are, are important, the idea of doing intergenerational living is really doing a multifamily building. So what this did do is limited some of our resources in terms of financially how we could fund things, but we do think it's important to be able to allow families and youth and elders to all live within the same building. So it's basically a cooperative living model, but in a multifamily setting. So it's taking some of the lessons we learned from common.com and we work, we live kind of modeling and putting that into a multifamily um, opportunity. So various price points is also important. Um, we are now serving pretty much that top high tier of probably the top 10%. That means that that middle income, uh, middle and upper, we have a whole large area that we could serve there. And then of course the affordable side is also a need. So we know that this is important for us to figure some of this out. Um, so that we can provide more. So this is where I think it gets a little exciting, at least for me, because um, I've really tried to figure out how do we do extended care services if you're doing a multifamily building? And so in this project in Detroit that I've been working on, I, I did meet a provider who does adult foster care, which is what they call residential assisted living in the state of Michigan. And he has agreed to help us with this as well. But I got the health department to agree that if you could do residential assisted living in a private home or a dwelling unit, why could you not also do it in an apartment? And so we're considering it a very large apartment. And in this case, it is a very large apartment because it has 20 residents that live there. Um, but it'll be 16 residents that need care. It'll be two uh, residents that will be students and two other unrelated uh, adults that basically can live in the live in the space so in that case adult foster care uh, works a little bit like child foster care where you whoever's in the household counts as a resident um, so it gave us some different opportunities but what if what if we could take residential assisted living and it could be part of not only a community at large, but it could also be part of multifamily, or it could be part of where an adult daycare center happens to be located and co-locate that. I think there's a lot of opportunity in co-location that we miss. And I think that has to do with looking at things in a bigger scope and thinking about the community at large and how do we connect within the community at large. Um, so we've worked with adult daycare, adult day healthcare, um, PACE centers, which is the program for all inclusive care of the elderly. I think that's one of the best programs that I've ever seen, mostly because it is uh, not disease focused, but prevention focused and health focused. Um, so when you think about it from a health and wellness perspective, um, some states do a very good job. Colorado does an excellent job. Um, other states, uh, Maryland, where I am, we, we have one, and but it's going to be expanded. And we're excited about that because we think that has a very good opportunity in Western Maryland and the Cumberland area. We've looked at taking home healthcare agencies and adding them into a multifamily building on the first floor as a tenant alongside the cafe and the food service piece. Um, and then looking at outpatient physical therapy and occupational therapy as part of that as well, um, in, a, in a way to provide extended care, um, particularly in the affordable market, because we can make that work a little bit better. Um, fortunately though, so the adult foster care also has a, a Medicaid component, and we don't have that in all states where we could do residential assisted living that's not all market -like. So definitely depends on the area. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about design process and elements, and I've, I've chosen lighting as the topic, um, and there's other topics we can also cover, things like acoustics, thermal comfort, um, mobility comfort. Those are like my four comforts um, that I think that if you can do those well, you can improve both the staff's lives as well as the residents' lives by using the built environment as an actual intervention. We do community planning, so we have a design framework. And so thinking of design as an intervention is not what people usually think of. I think they think of the aesthetic of it. How does it look like? How does it feel? But in realizing that when you're designing the environment, you could limit somebody's ability as well as, as foster it. 
So whether it's mobility and having handrails placed in the right location, if it's a grab bar that's not too high, it's just rightly placed for that person to be able to get up and down off of the commode by themselves, all those different things that we can look at as a positive intervention to allow people to be more independent or as independent as their condition allows uh, is really the goal. So we start with the premise of providing person-centered care. We look at human interaction, it's the basis for design. So identify, what does that mean, human interaction? That's basically identify where interactions occur or where you would like them to occur. So if it's in the outdoor space, for example, staff is usually not comfortable if they can't see out and keep connection, even if you have a fenced area that is your garden space or a wandering garden. And they want to be able to connect to that. Otherwise, they don't feel like they could do their jobs adequately because they can't see the residents when they're not within their, their, the confines of where they can see them. So we've had beautiful gardens set up in different uh, communities that I've worked in over the years, and I couldn't figure out why no one was using them. It was because it wasn't near someplace where staff had the sight lines. And so something as simple as that can actually provide human interaction in a draw. Um, and, and provide that. So, so whether that's a gardening opportunity or it's birds or butterflies or whatever it happens to be, but there's always an opportunity there for human interaction as well. And then we use the lens of service living. And what do I mean by that? So when you look at every different operational function that has to happen in your home, looking at it and thinking through it from the beginning to think about what does that mean to staff? What does that mean to residents? That means everything from the front door drop off sequence for both services and people and family, how is that going to be done? And, and just think through that, you know, where's the coat gonna be hung? Is there gonna be a wheelchair involved? Is there a transport wheelchair that's going to be needed? Is there clean, are we doing all our, our linen in-house? In is there gonna be clean and soiled? How are we gonna divide up clean and soiled? These are things that we learn from the facility side that have application to the residential assisted living side because those are just as important and it was exacerbated by what we saw during COVID. We also know that smaller environments based on the research that the Greenhouse Project completed, that that research was doing and demonstrated for sure that smaller environments did much better in the pandemic, both from spread as well as illness, as well as deaths. So I think that there's really something to be said for the smaller models on all, on all sides of this. So in looking at all those operational functions, you can actually understand better that, oh, this is where my food delivery is coming in. So I really don't want my trash to be going out that same door, or I don't want soil linen coming through there or through my kitchen or out my front door. So how do I evaluate that? And how do I establish where those, those, uh, those services are gonna occur? And then how do I make sure that those are gonna be done in the time that they need to be done? And we do the same thing for staff. So if you have a small staff room or a small area for respite and breaks, but you also may have a, a a toilet room that's just for staff. Staff prefer that. So we've found that through the research. So it's things like that that you start to take into consideration. When you're building purpose-built, it's obviously much easier, but those same processes have to happen even if you're doing something that's a renovated, a renovated home. And when you think about looking at uh, completing person-centered care, this is the other thing that we've, I've worked in China on a, on a building for about eight years. And in that, um, we realized very quickly that we want it to be person-centered from an assessment perspective. So a lot of times I'll ask an administrator, so who do you have living with you? And they're like, oh, we have you know, four people with dementia, three people with diabetes. So I'm like, no, 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 that's not my question. My question is, what do they like? What time do they like to get up? What's their favorite food? What's their favorite color? And the administrator looked and said, oh my goodness, you're asking a different question that I should definitely know the answers to and I don't. So that comes around to this idea of doing a person-centered assessment that looks at all the activities that they like, gives, gives them a background and a platform. And the other thing that that really helps is folks with memory care issues, because then if the family can tell you what their interests were and what their background is, it really helps with trying to do engagement with them. We do something called scenario training where um, I was grandma, grandma Jane, and we had grand, grandpa Mark with my client and some other people, and they all knew what our profiles were and they were to practice to that profile. And so on my profile, I had written that I was allergic to soy. And I just, cause I had to put something down on my, on my list. And so I was there visiting, I hadn't been there for about three months and I came to visit and one of the nurses aides comes running over and she's like, no soya, no soya. She really thought I was allergic to it. And she knew my profile so well that she knew to make sure that that did not occur. So the fact that somebody knew that that well, that's really person-centered. I mean, that's really understanding your residents and understanding what their needs are. 
So when we talk about design details, so this is improving access versus creating barriers. So we're going to talk about lighting. This will be a little bit, um, I would call this a little design geek techie, um, but I think that this just kind of gives you an idea of how the design environment and very various components, and this being one, um, can really positively impact the outcomes of both staff and residents. And so when you think about lighting, it's the lighting level, it's getting rid of glare. Shiny is not clean, by the way. Usually shiny means it's dirty. So it, Glare avoidance is very important. We know how, how hard it is for all of us to, to deal with glare. So then you add glasses and other conditions and aging conditions that can add to that. Creates a very difficult and creates fall risk in many cases. Um, circadian lighting, which is that uh, the natural lighting of from morning to night and adding that in. Um, Dave Racy did that in Evermore. Um, we've done that in a, uh, a setting up in Buffalo. And it's the first one in Western New York that was done. And their outcomes that are coming out of this have been tremendous. People are engaged, they're sleeping better, their agitation has gone down. It's everything that we thought and, and so pleased to see that those are actually the results that we're seeing. Tunable LEDs is a manner in which we can do circadian lighting because up until we had the development of technology of LEDs, we could not easily change the color temperature of the lighting. Now that is a very simple and actually quite inexpensive thing to do. Access to nature, views, and also the outdoors also helps with the resetting of circadian systems, also helps with vitamin D development and other things that are, are um, part of the, the natural systems that someone would from a day-to-day -day go to. I have been in nursing homes where residents have not been outside in literally 15 years. I cannot imagine. Um, the other piece we want to talk a little bit about is value contrast. So what value contrast is, is that if you have one wall that is white and you have a handrail that is dark gray or blue that gives you the value contrast between the surface you're trying to see and hold on to for support and the wall behind it. This works for many different settings, everything from your toilet walls to the toilet seat to uh, different things and we'll show you some examples of that. And then the last one being light reflectance values. So light reflectance values, if you've ever done a paint job and you've gone in and gotten your paint samples from the paint store, on the back of it, you'll see a number that says LRV. LRV stands for light reflectance values. That is a range of zero to 100 and zero being black and, and white being 100. In that range, you will find that certain things need to be a certain number of points apart in order for them to be seen well. So that back to the same example of the white wall and the dark gray or the blue handrail, that you're seeing that and that wants to be between 30 and 50 point difference so that somebody can visually see that. What does that do? Why is that important? Reduces fall risk. It, re it provides people not to hesitate when they're moving. That's one of the areas where people actually fall. It's the hesitation when people don't know what's on the floor or think it's a hole or water because of contrast. It will stop them and pause, and in the pause is often where the fall occurs. So creating different kinds of lights. We have task light that's for specific tasks. We have accent light that's to give you focal points, but also to kind of give you the ambiance of the space. And then we have ambient lighting, which is your general even overall lighting. So where the ambient lighting is really important is on the floor level, so that at the floor level, you don't see contrast and change. One of the best uh, technical manuals for this is called RP2820, um, is the newest publication of this, but it talks about when you need a higher level of task lighting versus what you might need for ambient lighting, and we'll show you a couple examples of those. So this is, is a good example. Those shadows that you see on those stairs, you can see how someone could easily fall on that staircase on the bottom. And so understanding that there's even light from above and also contrast on your riser and tread. So we don't often have, in residential assisted living, have staircases, but if you do have any types of stairs in an existing property that's going to remain, you wanna make sure that people can distinguish that edge because it's all about the edges. In terms of uh, reading lights, you want that to be a higher, a higher foot candle, FC is for foot candles, and you want a higher visual uh, acuity, so under cooler temperatures. So cooler temperatures mean toward the blue lights. The warmer amber lights are what you get in the very, very early morning and at, at night. And, and that's where you get the diffused light sources that start to calm people down uh, in, the, in the evening. Also shielding the light source. 
that can create glare. So if you can see the bulb, that's another good thing about LEDs because they have the little digital, uh, digitized pieces so it looks like a little circles. Uh, the little circles in, in that, in terms of the diodes, they, they, or diodes, they um, actually don't create a direct source that makes it much easier to cover the source. So you can avoid glare using the LEDs. Um, and, and including dimming and balancing your natural light with your artificial light. So there's a lot of sensors out that also allow you to do this that are, are very inexpensive. There's also sensors that you can utilize for shades controls too. And it used to be that that was a fairly pricey item, but now with, um, with the way the sensor world has just exploded, it's not an expensive thing to add or think about. So that if you have clear stories or you have other things that may create glare at certain times of the day, you could actually set that with your automated control and they would close and open those accordingly, according to the amount of daylight that they're receiving. Um, so it's, it's a lot of smart technology that is really, I think really something that we can all look at um, you also look at the carpet, where the carpet goes into the flooring that's adjacent to it, how it has about the same tone, that's tonality, that's very important, and it also does not look like a step or a hole, and it has a smooth transition. We still see a lot of the institutional bumpers, we call them, um, but it's basically a transition strip between a, a, a solid surface or a resilient flooring that goes to carpet. That little bumper can be very, very difficult for someone who's in a wheelchair or someone who has a walker or, or even using a cane or they shuffle. So we, we try not to do this. We try to do the Schluter strips underneath the edges to keep that from happening. Um, it's also good to know that in even the hair salon and, and spa, lighting to make you feel good. And we've all been in those in, in the salon chairs where they have a like the light is too harsh and it's fluorescent and it's cold. It doesn't make you look very good, it makes your skin look a little sallow. So basically the idea is that look at the lighting that makes you look good too. So it, it, it gives you a good representation of skin tone and things like that. Um, we also think that there's areas where preparation are taking place. So obviously under counter lighting, so that the lighting that you would do underneath your cabinets that would shine on the counters is very important for prep. Um, the dining table surface and then the flooring surface. I think this is a really good example because it gives you a good contrast between, you'll notice the chair seats are a nice contrast to the floor that allows someone to see the edge. Where do falls happen? Falls happen when something blends too much and you can't see that edge and therefore they don't know where the chair starts and stops and where the floor begins and where the floor stops. So I think this is a very good example. And it also has, um, I think we've done a great job with resilient flooring these last number of years because of the digital aesthetics. So you can get any kind of wood look, any kind of stone look, tile look, but with an, an even and a matte finish. Uh, one of my colleagues yesterday, we were talking and she calls Matt is where it's at, is what she says. So entry lighting, we always think about this in terms of doors, but we don't always think about it in terms of the resident doors and the entry to a resident room. So if you're trying to, if you're using swipe cards or you're using, uh, you know, the uh, most people don't use keys anymore. They use some type of swipe card um, or magnetic card that you just place the, uh, uh, an alignment to be able to open the door. But seeing that threshold lit between the corridor and the inside of the room is very important. Um, using other things in cues, whether it's artwork or a light fixture or even a memory box. We don't have good research that demonstrates the memory box actually helps the resident. It's really more of a family activity, but it does help the staff um, acclimate to who that person is. And I think that that is very important too. So you can use lighting as a wayfinding means and visual cues in adjacent or with um, things like your artwork and, and that type of thing. And you can see the handrail has that nice contrast to the, to the wall and that the wall itself has a contrast to the floor. It's one of my favorite room designs because it actually allows everyone to go outside. This is actually a hospice, uh, a hospice room. Um, but you want to include uh, night lighting as well as part of the, the bedroom lighting. So thinking about where and what the pathway is from the bed to the bathroom. The other thing is circulation spaces. And we'll talk a little bit about space requirements around things like beds and movements and chairs. So this is one of my favorite bathroom examples. So they backlit in amber, the tile. Why is this important? So amber is, a, is the light level that you can use at night that doesn't disrupt somebody so much or wake them up so much that they can't go back to sleep. 
And so there's a lot of nice things about this bathroom. It has the barn door as a swing. It has a roll-in shower with the back drain, which I always recommend because it allows the water to sheet off more quickly toward the back of the shower. It has grab bars within the shower. We usually we would also have a vertical on the opposite end. They have one on the end closest to the uh, to the sink, uh, but we would also put one on the other end. Um, when you change surface, you want that to be as smooth as possible. Um, but this idea of having the amber light and lighting the path from the bed to the to the bathroom, and you can even preset dimmers on that if you want to. But I thought this was a very clever way of getting the amber light and into the bathroom in a very gentle way. I also like the natural light component that's in the shower because it does add some additional natural light into the space and allows for the, the space not to feel as dark as a lot of times bathrooms are, are inboard um, to a space, so they don't have windows in them. So circadian lighting starts from that amber, like we were talking about, from the sunrise or sunset all the way to the high noon. And basically, when you have a, a light color that's in the blue tones, that's going to be when you're up and running, right? And that's when you want to keep people up and running. The problem is, is when you have that light level all the time throughout your entire space, all day and all night, that's when residents don't sleep as well. So this idea of changing the temperature of the light throughout the community or throughout the spaces. And what we found is one of our uh, manufacturers that we work with, he said that he had an instance where someone had, had been uh, gone into the living space, they were in the living room and, and they'd started to get a little drowsy and it was, you know, the temp timber of the light was going down toward the amber. And then they went out in the hallway, but the hallway was still blue light. So by the time they got back to their nice resident room that was back down to the amber light, it had reset them again and woke them back up. So it has to be consistent. So whatever the pathway is throughout the home, it wants to stay consistent. It also can help with night staff. So you want them to be alert, but nonetheless, if they can have something that's more toward the softer tones, that will help um, in terms of their own circadian lighting. Because night, night workers um, really do have a lot of potential for uh, negative health outcomes and things based on the fact that they are do night shift work. Um, so this gives you an idea what tunable LEDs is in, in the warmer light. So the right is the warmer color, the, the middle is the is the kind of middle of the road color and then the blue light. So it just gives you an idea of the, the, the timbre and the light differences. Um, this is a more institutional healthcare type of setting, but I thought it was a good example of how the tunables worked. Something else that we call is light layering. So light layering is basically still having a fairly even light on the floor, but also having some activity light and then some other light that's up above it that's used for accents. Um, this is also a good example of layered acoustics because it has carpet as well as resilient. And then from there, it has another layer that has a acoustic tile. Um, acoustic tile is usually not used in residential homes, but we do have products now that look like drywall, but they are acoustic in nature. They're starting to come down in cost and price. We do think that that's something to be valid to look at because the acoustics within a space can be very loud. The other thing we've looked at is doing recesses. So you may do over your fireplace and things like in Dave's setting, we had done a, a recess. And then in that recess, you could look at doing an acoustic treatment. And it might be a wood type of timbre that you use that's, that has uh, acoustic padding behind it or acoustic uh, perforations that allow it to be more acoustic. But blending it and thinking about those things in the very beginning of the design process is definitely recommended. So access to views, daylight, and outdoor spaces. There's nothing more frustrating for someone who wants to go outside and is not allowed to. So in the, the spaces up in Buffalo in an assisted living household that I just reviewed a couple months ago, I finally got to see it because we had worked on it a couple of years ago um, and they finally are open now. Um, we were able to see that people are in courtyards and they have full access all the time. So they're, this, the sight lines are there for the staff it gives people free access to move about. It does not make anyone feel like they're prevented from doing something. Um, so it reduces frustration and it allows for additional movement and things like that throughout. So I think that that's something very valid to look at. Um, we do have tons of research too about the, just in terms of the views themselves, uh, the view of a brick wall versus the view of nature. The view of nature is you know, less medications, better sleep patterns, all those things. Um, and those are transferable research uh, reports that were predominantly done in the healthcare setting versus long-term care, but definitely have transference over into um, our side of the industry. 
Um, so the other thing is this I really like is the daylight. The access to daylight here has really been thought through. The fact that it has two windows in the in the room I think is very relevant. And, and having that deeper, longer window I think is really important too. This is something that is at the end of a corridor. And the reason I show this is because a lot of times if you don't have the window at the end of the corridor or daylight at the end of the corridor, it can, I, it has, well, it has a bad feng shui, but besides that, it also has that feeling of, of not a, a little bit trapped and not open and not sunny. Um, and so that is really a good wayfinding cue two is to actually have daylight at the end of the corridor so we recommend that in terms of evaluation as well um, this is our garden space in the back of our building that we worked on in china and um, we got these some of these pictures that we had we thought that was like a real little lamb or whatever but they aren't they're little statues that they would place and take photos um, but they kind of have a life of their own so they show up in all different kinds of spaces um, but this has a wander path it doesn't ever make someone feel like they're um, trapped or they can't move forward or they can't move out. We have three different layers that were designed in to allow people to have complete freedom of movement and they'd actually have to go through three kind of security type areas to be able to get out of the garden. Um, but it has the wander path, it has uh, the lawn piece, it has a labyrinth that comes out of the physical therapy area, it has a garden that can be closed down to a smaller garden if you have a more vulnerable population, and then each uh, household on the upper floors has its own garden. You can see where the vines on the railings are just starting to grow up on the railings. So light and contrast, why is this important? Light and contrast, we perceive things by edges. And this was done in a University of Pennsylvania study that showed us this. And this idea of the examples of changing the light reflectance value between the floor and the wall allows the older eye to see the edges. It actually allows all of us because our brains work that way. Uh, but the flooring in this example is tonal and it doesn't provide a high pattern contrast. So when people say, no, you can't use any patterns, it's gotta be solids, that's actually not true. You can use a pattern, you just have to be very careful in the tonality of it and meaning that it doesn't have uh, high contrast, because high contrast can, can be perceived as being different dimensions. It can be perceived as something that falls away as well. This is a really good example of a transition strip. This was a sample that we did in our office because we wanted to put it in and test it. It has rubber underlayment under both. Um, the rubber underlayment is thinner under the carpet and thicker under the LVT, uh, the luxury vinyl tile. And we did that very purposely because we wanted them to meet and not have any kind of other type of top, top loaded or top shown uh, expansion joint or and or cover that would create a tripping hazard or something that would be difficult. And even if it meets the ADA, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's it's okay for elders. That was the ADA was not designed for accessibility of elders. It was designed for accessibility of returning veterans um, with upper body strength for the most part and mostly male. So there's a it's a different uh, a different tool that doesn't necessarily work always. So this opportunity to provide a smooth transition is very important uh, from one area to another. Um, and then using the appropriate use of, of contrast and tonality so in this case it was all grays and you can see that it's very tonal and so even though you're changing surface material there's there's nothing that that can create a problem at the scene this chair is not necessarily something we would choose for our communities but it is a good example of contrast and i just wanted to show it because it has arm contrast floor contrast seat contrast and back contrast so mostly if you can see those arms that's really important but you also want a seat to be have contrast to the floor um, this was in a hotel. Um, it was actually in, in Nashville and it, it was to replicate music in terms of the vibration of music, but moving patterns can create vertigo for older adults and younger people as well. So you want to avoid those strong high contrast flooring patterns and that hesitation or perceived need to step over something because that can definitely be a, a risk, a, a fall risk. So when we perceive the edges, like we said, about the spaces, we perceive everything by the edges. All edges need to be understood, so you want it to intuitively be known what they are. So this is good for all those with low vision. That means it's good for everybody. That gets us into inclusive environments or universal design or, or other things that you can call it. We call it inclusive environments because it goes beyond just the physical design. Seating edges in the floor, grab bars in the, in the background color, toilets in the background color, potentially the seat, handrails and quarter walls, base wall and floor, and evaluating those to make sure that those recommendations work. Um, 
I think this is an excellent example because this gives you a contrast on the wall. You can tell where the seating is. You can tell the seating from the floor. Um, flooring has a panel in, ha pattern in it, has a little bit of contrast in it, but I don't think it's anything that will cause problems. And I think this is a really good example of being able to use pattern and artwork and queuing and lighting all in one one little package. But I think this is a nice example um, for, for utilizing contrast and color. So you can see the one on the left with the lack of contrast versus the one on the on the, on the right that has a, a much stronger contrast with the green. I also love the windows in this project. If you, you the people were concerned about doing the lower windows that go to the floor that would create problems, and that was actually unfounded. And we found that when doing post occupancy, that was always something that people mention is the the deeper windows and the nice views and the, the feeling like you're indoor and outdoor space. And I think that that is is very important. And you can see the contrast from the floor to the walls is good, the floor to the ceiling. You can really understand the edges in the room. This is another free uh, reference that I would really like to recommend. It's called the Design Guidelines for the Visual Environment. The National Institutes of Building Sciences created this, and it tells you what the differences of the light reflectance value should be between things. So the only time when you would want like your doors and your everything to be the same color is when you were queuing out. And queuing out means basically if you had a mechanical room or a storage room or a medication room that you didn't want to attract attention to, you would basically paint it out or or queue out so that residents didn't realize that it was something that you you should or should be even interested in. The other thing that we have found is that if you did want to cue somebody out of not wanting to go into a space and creating, say, you don't want someone to go toward an elevator door or down a certain hallway, you can do something on the floor that's darker, but intentionally to keep someone from going there. Um, not because you you don't want them to be walking, you know, you don't want them to look at that as a whole or anything like that. But if it's something that would prevent them from moving forward in it simply because they wouldn't feel comfortable, that is a way to queue out. We don't do it on the floor so much um, as because we do worry a little bit about that, but we do definitely do that for the walls and different trim surfaces and things like that. So lack of contrast and no light reflectance value and shiny. So there's a lot of things that aren't really very good about this particular example um, versus this that uses contrast behind the toilet and it also has a contrast on the toilet seat. And no offense to any fellows that are on the, on the line, but we do find that aim is a problem potentially and that one way that that has been combated is to use the proper contrast. Um, some folks will use a red toilet seat or something else in, in contrast to that. So this is a little bit grainy because I really zoomed it in, but you can see how the appropriate use of color and pattern, it's, it's a different color, but its tonality is the same and there is an even no bump on the threshold. So it basically is a smooth transition. Um, so there are additional contributing factors to perception. And this has to do with different related eye issues that you may have as, as elders. So looking at things like age-related macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, sorry, uh, cataracts, glaucoma, et cetera, you can see the space in the middle versus the space on the outside and what happens. So for example, if you have, have macular degeneration or residents have macular degeneration and glaucoma, you may find that you may want if there's signage or something that's queuing, you may want something that's centrally located so someone can view it, but also it may impact where you put something on the edge as well. So you may find that redundancy could be a good thing because the redundancy would help different people with different conditions. So this is just something to keep in mind. And then uh, another contributing factor over that is that the aging eye yellows. And as it yellows, it, it, ten, it has a tendency of yellowing out the space. Um, it's a natural condition that does happen with age. And part of the issues with this is that um, usually things like orange and those types of color tones will pop out or pop at you, whereas you can see darker colors and blacks and navy blues, they just all go out, they all fall, fall away. So in looking at your colors, we always recommend using an acetate or something over it that, that actually shows you what the colors are and how well does it show underneath either the acetate or we use yellow glasses sometimes or whatever, but we use different um, different means to look at that. They do have visual binders, visor pieces that you can use that are like little, uh, uh, like a little template that you can basically look through and see what your finishes would look like. But we think this is an important test because a lot of designers don't know this. And I think it's important that you evaluate that when you're looking at different spaces. 
And the last section we're going to review is the furniture recommendation. So this has everything to do with everything from placement to circulation, quality of life, reduction of fall risk. So um, thank you, Dave Racy. This is your plan we're going to use as an example. Um, but we want to look at how the circulation evaluates. So because when we talk about doing, for example, a queen bed, so if you're going to do a queen bed, it has a certain size, right? And you also want to make sure that you have three feet around that bed because for a staff person to actually be able to work with someone or need to be on either side or any side of a bed that needs to be able to happen. We do, however, find one exception to that is for folks who have dementia, sometimes it is good to have a single or a double bed that actually goes against the wall because of a rolling out of bed. So it really depends on the condition and it depends on the layout and the type of furniture that you may have within your sleeping room. In other spaces, we want to make sure that um, you have room for a wheelchair to be able to pull up, um, whether it's a table or not. Table heights, no aprons typically, unless you're going to use the access table, which actually has small pieces in it that allows for a tray for you to roll up to it if you're in a wheelchair. Um, evaluating things like how much circulation you have between rooms, how you're getting from point A to point B, how many residents you're going to be in a, in a space at a time, who you're going to anticipate. So understanding all those circulation pieces. Um, we work hard on the bathrooms uh, as well to, to look at uh, not only the turn radiuses, but also the placement of grab bars. We love a system that has an up-down grab bar. Our favorite is a Danish system. Of course, it's a little more expensive than others, but it has an adjustability that goes up and down and in and out. So it actually allows you to set up the grab bar system perfect for the resident that's living in a specific space. One thing, if you're doing new builds or you're doing new bathrooms, we recommend definitely moving the toilet more than 18 inches off of the wall because it allows for another drop down grab bar, no matter what the configuration, but it gives space for a care provider to be on either side of a person. So if you have a right side person who had a stroke and that's the area that needs care or has an issue, you can get access to the right or the left. So trying to think through a lot of those different pieces and parts are really important. Um, we spend a lot of time in bathroom design. Um, there's, there's so many opportunities for it to be right and there's so many different things that can go wrong. So uh, it's an area that is really looked at quite a bit. Circulation in this case, you notice there's kind of two doors going in and out of the, of the kitchen. There's the one to the kitchen to the storage area, but there's also one outside the laundry. So that allows for things like the soil, soil linens, things like that, or things that need to come out, can come out, trash can come out, that kind of thing. Um, and, and then evaluating the garden space, which is out the opposite side of the house. Dimensions do matter. So one time I was, I was in a community and I was literally watching one resident trying to pull another resident out of a chair. So you can imagine where all that could go uh, pretty quickly and, and down quickly uh, was the real concern. So you can, they can increase or diminish the independence of the older adult, depending on what it is. You don't want it to be too low, too high, not too deep. I know it sounds a little Goldilocks-ish, but it, it is really true. Arms are important. Um, we have a tendency of pushing up and out and down is how we get up and down. We want a place for our feet to be able to sit slightly behind us when we go to get up. Um, so it's the type of seating, um, the ideal arm height, the seat height, no, not too deep of a seat, and having that place to place your feet so that you are not up against something so that you can't get your, your momentum. So ergonomically, if you put your feet below your inside your knees and your knees are forward, as you lean forward, you will naturally stand up. Um, if you practice that a few times, which is kind of an awkward movement, but if you practice it a few times, you'll get the idea of what people naturally do, which is where you place your feet, where you place your arms, how do you get up and down, and how do you get up and down in seats um, is very important. Here's a dining chair example. Um, we use a lot of quality furniture because it's indestructible um, and it, it lasts for a very long time. Here's another example. Always check your, your uh, table heights. And if you do have any type of apron whatsoever, make sure that your arms will fit underneath the apron because otherwise it'll be destroyed. Um, just from a, a, not just from a safety perspective and a, and a finger pinching perspective, but also you don't want the, if you're using wood furniture, you don't want that to be marred because then that becomes a reservoir for uh, pathogens or infection. Um, love seats, we use more love seats than we do uh, sofas, three people sofas, mostly because the middle seat doesn't get used. We uh, have a tendency of people laying down that you may not want people to lay down. 
um, necessarily, um, and also the um, getting up and down is much easier out of a, a, a love seat. Um, so we have a tendency of sticking pretty much to two seaters. These are also um, something that pops up the seat and there's a clean out underneath the seat. Um, this is a type of chair and design that we've seen and used quite a bit over the years that um, can you know, sustain the life of the product longer than some. So with that, we have a few resources I'd like to share with you. Um, the 2022 guidelines, uh, many of you know Michelle Pinkowski, she's been a good supporter. Um, she had an issue with your assisted living sections and we've actually for 2022, which is coming out, I'm hoping by the end of this month, our 2022 guidelines will be coming out. This is the 2018 cover. Um, every four years they're updated and there is a complete rewrite of the typologies for assisted living um, with Michelle's help in our volunteer committee uh, group uh, as a whole we were able to redo the assisted living sections with input from residential assisted living folks. So thank you for that and thank you to Michelle because it was a, a very good cooperative uh, effort that we worked on. Uh, the other part of this is that in that book, there is also guidelines on how to do a safety risk assessment, how to do a inclusive environment, meaning how do you provide access, and also resident quality of life. So when people go to program, I think a lot of times people aren't used to how do I do that? And, and it gives you good guidance in terms of how to do that. There is an evidence-based guide that I highly recommend. It was completed by a colleague of mine in Canada. It's called the Design Guide for Long-Term Care Homes. Um, it has the research directly attached to what some of the outcomes are and some of the planning and the, the layouts that you should be utilizing that supports is supported by research in terms of placement. So it could be toilet placement. Uh, there's a large section on bathrooms. There's some really good case studies on here on households. Um, it's available on the Facility Guidelines Institute's website, but it's also available on our educational site called the Seniors in Mind. We have a small senior living sustainability guide. This is really a process guide. Um, it is due for update. It's been due for update for a little bit, but the process part of planning and looking at the desired outcomes for your residents and staff and the operational side are, are still very valuable. So we can go to Q&A and I see that we've got some things flashing and there's some contact information for you if you're interested in more about Live Together or JSR Associates or just want to have a question. And we'll go back to showing the control panel and looking up questions what do we got here all right so i'm going to keep an eye here on the question box if anybody has a question go ahead and type it in there now i'm going to read it off to jane so we can go through those okay so here's one that's just come in can you describe the different services jsr has to offer oh oh sure um, yeah, so, so we do architecture and design, um, but we also do programming. Um, we also help uh, with care models. So if someone's trying to decide how do I want to staff my residential assisted living, we often will help people with that. And uh, sometimes we look at it from a universal worker perspective because you may have a chef and you may have two or three universal workers, or some people do it with personal care worker and then uh, someone who does environmental services uh, separately, um, but then they're still part of the team. So we try to cross-reference and cross-train a little bit on person-centered care. Um, so, so we can help with those types of items. Um, we do not do direct placement of staff, um, but we can help train staff with scenario training. Um, we've we've done um, a lot of programming work. So if you're trying to figure out um, the operational side of what you're doing and how you want it to do and all that. Um, the licensing code uh, segment, um, we found that some of those relationships in the Facility Guidelines Institute have been very helpful on some of our projects uh, where people will need to uh, understand and have uh, have access to either people in the health department or whatever. Um, and we find that that can be uh, very valuable as well. Um, so that's kind of kind of us in a nutshell. We also do sustainability design. So we have access to things like Fitwell and Well and uh, Green Globes and LEED. We, we are more Green Globes and Fitwell folks, mostly because it's a more affordable systems that they utilize for sustainability and health and wellness evaluation. Fabulous, that was a wonderful answer. So another question that just came in is for memory care and dementia care homes specifically, are there specific colors, lighting, or design tactics that cater towards those residents' needs? 
Yes, we find that the circadian lighting system particularly is, is most effective. It's effective for everybody, but it's most effective with folks with memory care. Um, and we think that is because the natural systems get off kilter and that does help with those. There aren't any specific colors per se, but I would use the light reflectance value information the same as you would universally for anybody who's who's getting older. And if you do it for them, it'll be good for us too. Um, so the, the other thing we do find though is, is evaluating things like all of your edges. You know, you don't want sharp edges, you want rounded edges. Uh, and and re engagement is important. We find that that access to daylight and having access to outdoor space is particularly important with those with memory care and cognitive uh, functional issues. Um, and, and I believe it is just the, the opportunity to move where they want to go. So anything that you can do in your planning processes that allows them the freedom of movement, the better. Um, we do have issues sometimes with rummaging, folks that rummage in other people's things, and, and we've used special types of uh, wardrobes and things like that to try to keep people from rummaging uh, in other people's resident in their things. Um, obviously, closing the door, things like that, are usually usually help as well. But there can be some of some of that, and it really depends on each personality. Um, engagement and the circadian system lighting is what we found to work the best. Anything that you can do to allow for sleep at night um, and sundowners. Um, there is also folks that we have found that have uh, households that are are almost like a well, it'd be like a household for nighttime care, if you will, or respite care, um, where they'll do households and the small houses will be built specifically for those who, uh, for for family family caregivers who actually need assistance at night because they're not getting any sleep. Um, and so they bring their loved one and they have a resident room just like you would in our houses you know, normally. Um, and, and they do that almost like in a, a night nighttime adult daycare, if you will. Um, that allows some respite for caregivers. We have one here in Maryland and I've visited it. It's, it's quite well done. Uh, feels just like a household, except it's used um, more in the evening and at night than it is during the day. Um, so, and, and memory care is so individual. I think that we often think that folks with dementia, it, it's like one category, but it really is if you have one person with dementia, you have one person with dementia because everyone is different. Um, knowing as much about that person as possible, knowing what moments can they engage or where they would like to engage. Um, I've also noticed that uh, designers and architects who have not worked with the population before are afraid of it. Um, I was too probably when I was much younger, but I find that they, they, there's something about mental health and mental health issues and cognitive frailty that, that kind of, it scares people a little bit. Um, so trying to make it not so scary. Um, it was delightful to see people completely engaged when I was in, in Buffalo in October, um, it was October, November when I was visiting. It was wonderful to see them all alert during the day. Um, so that taking advantage of that opportunity um, of keeping people as active as possible uh, during the day, I think is is really a big, a big part of it. Um, and, and things to do with your hands, finding out what they liked. I mean, is it, you know, just folding towels and, and doing different household chores? Are those the things that are familiar to them? Um, it could be something different. A lot of places have pets too. They'll have, you know, a dog that lives in the house or they'll have a couple of cats that live in the house. It's more complicated, I know, but it, it does, uh, if you plan for it, uh, it, it can create good positive distractions. Um, I asked Bill Thomas that. I said, so what do you do when you have someone, like my grandmother would not have been happy with cats. She didn't like cats, she didn't trust them. And he goes, oh, we give those residents squirt guns and we let them <laughs> water down the cats. And I thought, I can see my grandmother standing at the corner waiting for the next cat to come around the corner because she would have gotten the light uh, no more uh, than anything else than squirting the poor cat with the squirt gun. But, um, so those are some, some ideas on, on the memory care side. Fabulous. Okay, just a couple more that have come in. Um, Maureen asked, what was the last guideline resource from Canada? Oh, here, I'll go back up and we'll show you that one. Fabulous. The design guide for long-term care homes. Yep. Um, Her. Yeah, this is my friend Robert Rublaski. He literally puts all the research that he does, he places it on his construction documents so that if a contractor questions why something is the way it is, it is all right there. 
Uh, I'm not exactly sure how he does it. We've been trying to automate the system that he's doing uh, predominantly manually, but he, he trains all of his staff to be evidence-based in terms of making decisions about placement of everything from grab bars to uh, how a shower works, all kinds of things. But um, really, it's a very, very good resource. Awesome. And I just put that link in the chat uh, as well for anybody who's interested. And the last question from Susan, is the licensing the same in RAL as other types of assisted living environments? No, that's the problem. Um, yeah, so so the, the guidelines uh, codes, let's see, we'll go up one more. Um, so these are adopted in many states, um, and there's basically three types that are outlined here. Um, one is the RAL. The other is household and small homes, um, and whether they're uh, a gathering of more than one or not, um, but they're households. The other one is the apartment style, because we still see a lot of apartment style assisted living as well that has the centralized services on one floor. We, we kind of refer to that not in a favorable way, really, as the big box uh, uh, in some assisted living settings. But um, so there's basically three different settings. A lot of it is determined by the number. So like in Dave Reese's project at Evermore, that was eight residents and that eight residents could be in one home, but it had to be on one independent resident site, the residential site. So you could only have eight per resident site. And that went through the Department of Social Services. Um, and it was actually more of a group home type of licensure. So it depends on number of people. Um, it depends on the, the type of staff. Sometimes it depends on the type of care you're providing. Um, we're working on one right now that is is a really residential assisted living light in a sense because it's unlicensed um, and you can have up to 10 residents that can can live in that type of setting in a home. Um, and uh, that's with uh, James Miles. He's he's one of your members as well from our, our LNA. Um, but it, it really depends. And that's the tricky part is each state. Um, is so different and then they adopt different codes. So some have adopted these guidelines here that the FGI produces, but others have their own. Um, in the state of Maryland, they reference uh, some of the guidelines, but um, only really for nursing homes and hospital. Um, nursing homes and hospital have a tendency of being uh, under the Department of Health um, and assisted living could be under any range of health and human services to social, social services to uh, Department of Health. Um, we've seen it under other other jurisdictions as well in terms of different departments and agencies. Um, and then sometimes the size of it will also determine who reviews it, like in Indiana. Um, so if it's a larger home, it does have to go through the Department of Health. If it's not, then it does not have to go through the Department of Health. So unfortunately, there's no black and white answer on that one. We've tried to align codes between states forever, both the building code as well as the licensing code. And um, you know, that would be my, my, my dream of a perfect world is to have those aligned, but that's unfortunately not the case. All right. Well, wonderful Q&A. Um, there are a couple questions that came in in regards to will they get access to these slides? And we will be sending out a recording of this webinar to everybody, which I think is probably the easiest way to do that. Um, so everyone who is on the registration list will get a recording of this. So to close out everything, is there anything else you want to add, Jane, on top of the presentation you've already made? I don't think so, but I really want to thank you for your time and, and attention, and I hope it was helpful for everyone. And uh, I am glad you recorded it. I was going to ask you about that because I, I would like to have the recording as well. Um, and if you have any questions or if I can be of any help, by all means, you know, uh, drop me an email or, or let me know. Um, and uh, I really appreciate your time and, and letting me share with you some of the knowledge that we have. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you to everybody who attended, and we'll see you on the next Rollno webinar. Thanks. Bye bye, everybody. Have a good day.